this week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with a longtime quality and regulatory professional, Dick DiRizio, about the do's and don'ts of complaint handling. Plus, are there hidden risks in root cause analysis? We'll find out when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for April 12, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Ducharme. Mm -hmm. So, for any of you interested in kind of in climate change and energy and all that sort of stuff, there was an interesting energy study done by our friends at MIT. First of all, uh, a little bit of background. Energy reduction targets uh, implied by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, has suggested a 50% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 as a means of avoiding further climate change. But during that same period, economists have estimated that global demand for materials will double. So if you do the math, uh, put those two bits of data together, it would mean that we would have to reduce energy use by 75%. So double the output, but half the energy use equals about a 75% reduction. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is this possible? Well, researchers at MIT say while there is still a lot of room for improvement, we are approaching the theoretical limits of materials manufacturing. That is, there's a certain required, physically defined amount of energy required to make certain products. I mean, you, you can't get below, you can't get away from the physics. It takes a certain amount of energy to smelt aluminum. It takes a certain amount of energy to do any of these kind of uh, materials transformations. Mm -hmm. And we're getting close to the, th in some cases, getting close to those theoretical images, uh, limits. Mm -hmm. So research has looked at the five most energy intensive materials. So we're talking steel, cement, paper, plastics, and aluminum, which, I didn't realize this, make up half of the energy used and more than half of the carbon dioxide emitted in the manufacturing sector, those five materials. So in the end, the group found that the manufacturing sector as a whole would only be able to reduce its energy use by about 50%. A major constraint, uh, researchers say, is simply, as we mentioned before, the material's thermodynamic limit, the minimum amount of energy required to manufacture from mm -hmm. the raw materials. Uh, we've already made great strides, they say, and the best available technologies are already approaching those limits, particularly for those five materials they studied. So it's going to be pretty costly to make any further gains. So while it's worthwhile to improve the efficiencies, and we really want to do that, in the end, it really boils down to you and I. Oh, you and I. Right. Yeah. I mean, what they say is, you know, manufacturing can only go so far. You're only get, you're, as you approach the technical limits of, of what you can do, you're still not going to reach that 75% reduction that we're guessing we need to make. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have to be, you know, again, you know, you don't want to produce new materials. Maybe it's more recycling. Maybe yeah. it's different types of materials and so forth. But uh, kind of interesting study. It's kind of where we're, where we're going, we're not going to get there just doing the status quo. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, lean, we have to lean out the process. We have to right. lean out the, the, the customer, the, the end user well, the, part the, of the process. The end user yeah. part of the process, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. and that's, that's where a lot of the waste really still is anyway. You know, I mean, we, we, want, we don't want to give up our stuff. Right, that's true. <laughs> but, you know, you think about how far we've come as consumers. I mean, gosh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, recycling was pretty rare in America, right? right? But until the waste management companies made it easier, they gave us bins, right? They gave right. Us the, and so now, oh, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, I can do it. Easy. So, yeah, I, it, yeah it's, it's our responsibility, but it, it's going to have to be made as easy as possible to encourage that to continue to go forward if we're going to continue yep. to achieve those gains. Exactly. Thank you, Derek. All right, we'll turn it now to a, a rather sad piece of news, uh, obviously. Renowned statistician George E. P. Box recently passed away at the age of 93. In Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, we ran a retrospective of the man from Matthew Barcelo titled Statistics for the Rest of Us. Now, alongside his father in law, Ronald Fisher, Walter Schuhart and a handful of others, Box was really one of the giants in the field of statistical analysis. His work in design of experiments in particular was, was very notable. Now, following the, the publication of Barcelona's article, we received several notes from Quality Digest contributors and readers about Box's life and career. And I'd like to take a few moments to read portions of some of these comments, which I think shed uh, some additional light on, on George uh, E.P. Box, a, a, an interesting, interesting man. According to Davis Balistracci, one of our columnists, one of our columnists, quote, he was a great teacher, witty, and a very approachable, hum humble human being. He was the ultimate statistician statistician, and every bit the gentleman. 
The public at large wouldn't know him, but statisticians of my generation did and universally respected him. So says Davis Balistrachi. Tom Piasnik, another of our longtime columnists, wrote, when I was starting out my career in the 1970s, his work on design of experiments and response surface analysis was already legendary. Unlike many other authors of technical topics and quality, Dr. Box's writing style was down to earth and unpretentious. He made the subject of design of experiments, which can be daunting, fun to learn. I, we, will miss this great man, a true pioneer and leader in quality. And finally, there's this rather humorous anecdote, I think, from Roger Horrell. I met George Box for the first time at a Gordon Research Conference on statistics in chemistry and chemical engineering, at which he was somewhat of a regular. He was always passionate about whatever he was discussing, and in many cases, what he was debating. I remember one speaker giving a talk on time series, and George got very animated during the discussion period, challenging the speaker's work, which was not at all unusual for the Gordon Conference. George asked in a loud voice, where did you get that equation? It's wrong. The speaker thought for a minute and then replied, well, I actually got it out of your book, George. You could have heard a pin drop. But not to be outdone, George replied, well, it's still wrong, and sat down. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Great story from Roger Hall. Well, for more information on the life of George Box, just click on the story link to Matthew Barcelo's article, again, titled Statistics for the Rest of Us, found just below the player page. And as always, all of Dirk's story, all the stories that Dirk and I are going to be covering on the show today are accessible through these links, which you can find, again, right down there. And actually, we're going to have more comments on uh, George Box mm -hmm. uh, next week. Um, these, you saw some of the comments. We actually have extended comments from each of those people that you saw there, plus a few more that have come in uh, during the last few days. So uh, uh, for those of you who are deeply involved in statistics, most of you know who George Box was and his contributions, and uh, you'll want to read those comments. Many contributions. Next week yeah, in yeah. one of our articles. Okay. Well, uh, let's get on to uh, our guest coming up here. Uh, often when we think of complaint management, we think of regulated industries where complaint management is, let's say, actually a requirement. The FDA, for instance, uh, is a good example of that. But the basic concepts of complaint management apply equally well across a broad range of industries, not just the FDA. An effective complaint management system can help your company reduce risk. When we're talking liability risk mm -hmm. here, financial risk, the risk of losing customers, and so forth. So really, a complaint management system should be looked at as part of your overall quality management system. And here to give us a bit of his perspective on complaint management is Dick DiRizio. Uh, Dick has worked with complaint management from both inside the FDA, he was with the FDA for 10 years, and outside the FDA, I believe in mostly uh, pharmaceutical industries. Uh, Dick is going to be joining, he was going to join us via Skype, but we had a problem with Skype, so we're, we've got Dick on the phone with us. Hi Dick, how are you? I am fine. Thank you very much, Dirk. It's great to be with you, Mike, and all of your viewers. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the webinar and, and great to have a chance to preview it today. All right. Well, very briefly, uh, before we kind of get into kind of some nuts and bolts of complaint management, just really quickly set, set the ground for us. What are we talking about when we say complaint management? You know, it's, it's really the life cycle of maximizing the value that we get out of customer input and customer feedback. So it's this overall process. It starts with training field reps and customers of why it's important and what we're going to do with that information, and then quickly and responsibly taking that through receipt, investigation, and then in establishing measurements so we can see how the process is working and then moving through failure investigation into some remedial action if it's needed. And what do, you, what do you see as the biggest deficiency then in complaint management uh, today? I mean, is, is it non-existent or is it just poorly implemented? What are we talking about? Well, you know, in the medical device industry, there's been a requirement, a regulation to do complaint management for well over 30 years. And uh, the interesting thing is it's not about companies not having procedures. It's about implementation and execution. It's a failure to, to monitor. It's a failure to lean out the process. And I'll be giving some examples of some high-powered, lean designs that we put in place in some previous companies. And companies get into this vicious cycle of creating a backlog of overdue complaints that are open. They get bogged down. And often they're missing some important information that uh, in, in the FDA world could mean missing a reporting requirement for an adverse event. Or it could mean delaying a performance improvement that ultimately could result in a field action such as a recall. So, Dick, if I understand what you're saying here, I think, is, is that there's really a kind of a, a dovetailing, maybe, uh, in a sense, between 
complaint management, handling complaint management, and the other quality improvement efforts that you may want to undertake as mm -hmm. part of an organization. You know, that's a great way to put it, uh, because there is a dovetail as long as there are organizational barriers. And what I mean by that is oftentimes the complaint management group could be in one section of a quality organization and there might be a separate quality engineering group that really needs to be involved in a seamless manner so that, that information gleaned out of those precious complaint reports gets fed into a failure investigation process, a root cause analysis, and on into a corrective action is necessary. And so the organization has to be set up in a way that doesn't impede that. And this is particularly a challenge in, in multinational, multi-planned organizations where you need information from a facility. How do you get that information quickly? You know, it's basically a matter of complaints need to be closed on average in 30 days or you're simply going to be building a backlog. And, and Dick, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you talk about multinational organizations and so forth. And one of the things that, that kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess concerns me for a little bit is when we talk about complaint management, I think of something that takes a lot, of, a lot of resources, a lot of energy. I mean, is this really something that even small companies can do on limited resources? And, and if so, how would they even get started? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and especially in the medical device arena because so many medical device companies are very small. And in fact, when they're small is probably when they need to get the best information about how their products are doing. And I just want to just mention too that when we're talking on Tuesday on the webinar, we'll be covering principles that apply to every possible industry and, and, and the vigilance, the, the awareness, the reaction to sentinel events that could apply whether it's uh, products for the home, if it's automobiles, if it's aircraft, all of the supplies, and I, and I hope to make it general in that way. I think small companies have an advantage because they, out of necessity, have to be lean. Uh, it means they have to really look at how they do this. I've never seen a company of any size say we have too many people in the complaint department. It just seems one of those areas that we haven't really done a good job in, in, in pacing you know, the workflow and, and measuring what the work requirements are. But, but what they will typically do is start with a lean process and just engage people, you know, in, as part of their role to handle this customer input. And, and what I'll talk about Tuesday can definitely help the smallest of companies do this in a lean manner. The key is the work rules, how to make decisions about when a complaint comes in, when can it be closed immediately, or when does it require an investigation, and how can that be done quickly. You know, Dick, listening to you, you chat about this, uh, you know, came to me that, you know, we, we're talking about lean here, and lean is often thought of really as a manufacturing initiative. Um, explain to us a little bit, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, how um, complaint handling can create muda or can create waste in the organization. You know, what does that do when you have, all right, you want to close your complaints after 30 days? Well, if you don't, what are the risks? What are you talking about here? If you have a 60, 90 plus day cycle where you're not closing these, these complaints, what ends up happening? You know, I'll, I'll give you some examples just from far past and recent past. Uh, it, it's a great observation. We did a Kaizen event in one case to uh, look at the process flow of a complaint unit where we recognized that there were issues with timeliness of closure, building of a backlog. We found that there were 45 touches on every complaint file, when in fact that number maybe could be in the single digit. They just were doing things that didn't make sense as far as how they handled each complaint report. So uh, definitely the mood issue, and it's, uh, it's just so amenable to process mapping, Kaizen events. I've just seen the magic of a functional group working, say, spending a couple of days on this and transforming a process into something that really makes the most of a valuable customer. I think that was. I think that was the end of uh, not live, the end of Dick Dorizio in person, but uh, live end of TV. Dick Dorizio live. But in any case, okay, that was actually our last question. So, well, th uh, thank you, Dick, for joining us uh, again. Sorry we had uh, some problems with the Skype there and a little problems with the phone line at the end. Made it right to the end though. But that's, we that's kind of good. kind of finished it up. Uh, uh, that was actually our last question for yeah. Dick. In any case, but but next one, next Tuesday. Yeah, join us yeah. next. If, if you're interested, uh, Dick is going to be uh, speaking on a webinar, one-hour webinar next week, next uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. 
see it there on your screen. Yep. Uh, if you want to link out to it to uh, sign up for that webinar, if you go to the article that is also uh, underneath the screen, you can link out there to the article. Within the article, there's a link out to the webinar. You can sign up. Uh, we'll also try to get a link underneath the player page here uh, later on this morning if you come back yep. and are interested. So there you yeah, go. Thanks. So uh, if you're still there, Dick, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Good luck Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thanks, Nick. We'll see you on Tuesday. All right. Good guy. And it's going to be a good webinar. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Something uh, that many opinion people in, in all industries, I think, really need to, to deal with is understanding how you deal with your complaints yep. and how you do that. Okay. Good oh, stuff. Speaking of risk. Speaking of risk. Yeah. Speaking of risk. We, one of our highest, uh, highest most well-read articles this week uh, was about risk and was about root cause analysis as well. The title of the piece was The Risks in Root Cause Analysis by John Flagg, and that appeared in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, it was a popular article, and it's popular, uh, I think partially it was popular because it was a great title. Risks and Root Cause Analysis. Yeah, yeah. Two, two of our key topics. Yeah, that's right, right. absolutely. All in one. But you know, if you came for the title, if you came for the headline, and you stuck around for the content, you got a lot out of it, because this, this was a really good piece by John, and, and John Flagg has, has a, a great ability to take very complex issues and make them very understandable. This is a very approachable piece, and it really gets to the heart of, of what the risks are in root cause analysis and how root cause analysis maybe is done incorrectly in some, some, sometimes in some places. He really starts by looking at, at you know, the title, the, the name, root cause analysis. Well, how many times is there one root cause right. of a problem, right? Really root causes analysis to, just to, be, to begin with. Right. And, and that kind of gets to the heart of, of what he's talking about here is people look at root cause analysis and they think root cause. Well, you're never, you're almost never going to be able to nail it down to a single cause. You know, the issues that we're dealing with, that you're dealing with out there in the field are so complex that there's going to be many, many root causes that are going to tie to any, any effect that may happen. John begins really by looking at, at how you deal with root cause analysis. And the first thing that many people do is they form cross-functional teams mm -hmm. of brainstormers. And they start to, to brainstorm. They start to try to uncover, you know, they write up on a, on a blackboard or they write it up on, on tear sheets or whatever it may be. They write up... What are the problems, and why do we think this is happening? Well, <clears throat> it's great. Brainstorming is great. It, it's, it's a great tool for many uses, and it's great for root cause analysis as a part of root cause analysis. But it, it's rather limiting as well. It's limited by, by several things, and one of the things is limited by groupthink. People tend to begin to, to think alike when you're in that, that circumstance. Another thing is it's difficult in that scenario to, to really properly weigh <clears throat> the magnitude of each factor. You know, you're looking at different factors, and do you really understand well, you know, one factor is a factor of one, one factor is maybe a factor of 50. Can you uncover that through brainstorming and understand, you know, kind of in a theory of constraints right, perspective, right. you know, are you going to be able to tackle those things first that really are going to, going to change the, the, the problem? <clears throat> he also talks about fishbone analysis, fishbone diagrams, right, Ishikawa, Ishikawa yeah. diagrams, uh, cause and effect analysis. And those can be effective too. We've all done them. We've all seen them. Those can be very effective too, but they also can tend to fall short in a root cause analysis. Well, they, they suffer the same problem, is, is, is you don't know how much of an impact, even if you exactly dial right. down to a particular root cause, you sure. don't know how much of an impact is that particular root cause having on the output. It may, right. it's, it's an effect. I mean, it's, it's a cause, but how big of a cause? How big of a cause? Yeah. And, and you start getting down to the subsets of this, you know, start getting down to X1, X2, X3, X4, uh, yeah. of X being, being the, 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 the causes cause, yeah. and Y being the effect. You start getting down to you know, four or five levels down of an X. Well, how much is that affecting Y? And maybe, you know, maybe there's one situation where, where the first level down, the X1, is really impactful to, to Y. And maybe, but maybe level four of some other problem is even more impactful. And, and you know, you don't weigh those and say, well, this level four is level one, so level one is obviously more important. Right. Maybe not. And, and doing an Ishikawa diagram won't necessarily uncover that for you. Um, and it could actually kind of, kind of make you struggle even with it even more because you may be chasing things that aren't really yeah. the, the, the true problems. Um, what, what Flagg suggests here, and again, it circles back to George Box in, in, in a certain sense. George Box was noted, as I mentioned earlier, for working very closely with design of experiments. And Flagg closes his article by suggesting that, you know, you, you look at, at, at doing a design of experiments, because design of experiments will help you with the weighing factors. If you set it up properly, if you design sure. that, that properly, you're going to be able to, to understand a little bit better, maybe, through DOE, what really is affecting your output and what really is, what X's really are affecting those Y's. Um, I think that the reason I was interested in this article and the reason why I related to it really well is I think that we're all root cause analyzers, right? We all, we all do this every day in our lives and, and most of us, even highly influenced, uh, highly experienced quality professionals, don't do it particularly well. And, and, and I, I think we do it 
definitely less well than is necessary. And the question is why? Why? Well, Dirk, do you know the term uh, cum hoc ergo propter hoc? Oh, sh of yeah. course. You know what that means? What does it mean? I had Latin in high school. You, you did? No. Wow. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I didn't, I, I didn't no either. I, but there's this thing called the Google now, where you can <laughs> go Google. in and you can go into the Google. <laughs> you and, go to and, the Google. And you can find all this stuff out. It's great. Uh, yes. Cum hoc ergo, ergo propter hoc. Uh, with this, therefore, because of this in, in, the, in okay. the literal translation. Or root cause. What it's come to mean for, <laughs> for those of us that don't speak Latin every day is uh, correlation doesn't imply causation. causation right. And that's really what we're talking about here. There, there may be cor correlated events that, that may have, have, an, have an impact, have an effect to, to an outcome, but that doesn't necessarily mean, especially when it comes to the weighing of that, that you're going to really understand where, where those are. Just because it's correlated doesn't mean that it's causing it. And I think that's something that, that we all maybe make a mistake on. Well, I think you, you touched on, uh, you mentioned, did you mention groupthink? Groupthink, yeah, yeah. In, in the brainstorming. In the, uh, in the brainstorming. Yeah. And I think that is, uh, sometimes people uh, reach for the, the, obvious, the obvious cause, yeah. and, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that, well, that must sure. be the cause, absolutely. And it is a cause, but it is not the cause. And sometimes we're our own worst enemy because sometimes we don't, we don't even dig e even deeper. Uh, and I mean, I guess what I'm, uh, what I'm saying by that is, you know, he talks about the Ishikawa diagram and how you can get down too far and how sometimes going too far is too far. Yeah. But sometimes you have the opposite problem because of groupthink, which is the low-hanging fruit, and you don't go deep enough. Yeah. You kind of stop at the first thing everybody agrees on, yep. and you don't bother digging in any deeper and getting down to what may be the actual real root cause. Like so many of these things, it comes down to the psychology of the human factor that's involved in the process. That, that you say groupthink is a big thing in it. Pattern seeking is a big thing. Again, the, the, the cause and effect nature of this, the fact that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. We're pattern seekers. That's how we all learn. We all learn by listening and seeing and repeating and, and changing as we go. That causes us to fall in a hole too, I think, with root cause analysis, is that we're looking for patterns. We're seeking patterns even where it maybe doesn't necessarily exist. And through cutting through that static and looking for the meaning in that, sometimes you can really go, go pretty right. far astray. Really good article here uh, from John Flagg, and I encourage everyone out there to read it again. The, the link is right below the player page, The Risks in Root Cause Analysis. It ran this week in Quality Digest Daily. You can check it out, find the story link just below the player page, and give it a read. Well, I mentioned, glad you mentioned patterns. Yes. Because that actually is a really lame segue for this wow. next piece. <laughs> but, but, it, but it works, it works, segues. We look for them. Okay, in his column this week, the similarities between offshoring and telecommuting, we can call that a pattern, a similarity, right? Sure. Columnist Steve Vaughn argues that there is a parallel to the arguments for and against offshoring and for and against telecommuting. What, he point, what he's uh, pointing to at the very beginning, you know, recently in the news, uh, Yahoo, uh, Best Buy, both have are basically recalling their telecommuters and saying that we want you in the office, we don't want you working at home, and they give a variety of reasons for that. Vaughn is making the argument that there really is some similarities between the arguments of bringing back into the office telecommuters and moving from offshoring to reshoring. A lot of the same arguments apply. So for instance, uh, you know, Yahoo and Best Buy both argue that they see the need for face-to-face interaction, something that is really kind of lost in telecommuting. And a similar argument is made for uh, reshoring, says Vaughn. You know, the, the offshoring separates production from design and engineering and hampers innovation and development of uh, new products or services. So there's this idea that when you lose that face-to-face -face contact, whether it's through telecommuting or offshoring, that you're losing that human interaction that really leads to uh, innovation, uh, you know, kind of instantaneous brainstorming. Uh, you, any of you who telecommute know exactly what I'm talking about. You're not in the office and you miss out on the, oh man, we had this awesome brainstorming session. Boy, you wouldn't have believed would have come up. Well, yeah, I wasn't there and you can only do so much via you know instant messaging um, well the fact of the matter is if I can interrupt you is that is that many telecommuters telecommute not from a very long distance so there's this feeling that maybe because you're in proximity 50 100 miles away that that's better than than being thousands of miles away in your supply chain maybe but it really isn't any different it, it, it isn't any different because due to tech matter of fact one of the reasons and, and Vaughn goes into this a little bit one of the reasons that we have offshoring and telecommuting, the reasons are basically the same. It comes down to technology. Hey, we have the technology. I mean, I telecommute. Um, I'm 100 miles from the office. He's not even here right now. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm virtual. Um, 
I telecommute, and, and you know, I've got instant messaging, I've got the phone, you know, I've got, uh, you know, I've got email. I keep in contact just as much as, as I want, but I can guarantee you it is not the same as being in the office. Technology also allows us to offshore. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, it's very easy for us to communicate with our suppliers and manufacturers in, in Asia or South America or Mexico or wh wherever because distance is really, in terms of communication, distance is no longer an issue. But it's still, they both suffer from the same problem. Both telecommuting and offshoring suffer from the same problem, where um, there's a lack of quality control. Uh, you know, the extension of the su supply chain uh, has its inherent risks, like, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, inefficiencies, and, and so forth. And so uh, Vaughn isn't saying, in his article, Vaughn isn't saying that we have to give up telecommuting. We don't have to give up offshoring. We've got to balance it. We've got to do it when it makes sense. If it makes sense to offshore, if you've looked into it and you're not doing it just because, you know, the company down the street's doing it, if it makes financial sense for you, then, yeah, sure, you do it. You've got to weigh the pros and the cons. Same thing with telecommuting. Telecommuting does not work for everybody, and that's the argument that Yahoo and Best Buy are making. Telecommuting doesn't work for everybody. For some people, it does. It's basically the nature of your job, and you don't do it just because you have the technology to do it. Right, and for a company like Yahoo or Best Buy, which are big companies with a lot of employees, there's a level of complexity there that, that a company like ours doesn't necessarily have because we don't have that, that, that amount of employees. Where you know if they have thousands of employees across the world, you've got to be you've got to be even-handed with everybody. You've got to give everybody the same opportunity, or nobody gets the opportunity. And I think certainly within Yahoo and Best Buy's group of people that were working from home that were telecommuting, there was a lot of them that it was probably working really well for, right. and it may not work as well for the rest of them now. Um, but again, you got to be even-handed with it. It's either it kind of it's not a well, right. yeah, you can, but you can't. It's going to have to be even-handed, and that adds complexity to it as well, I think. Right, and I think just uh, real quick, just tying back into, let's, let's say, the, the, the quality aspect of this, is, is there is a certain amount of, of quality in the process that comes from face-to-face uh, communication. I mean, we, we mentioned uh, brainstorming, yeah. uh, something that happens a lot here in any, uh, in any media company. A lot of the ideas that come for stories, a lot of the ideas of how to spin a story, don't come from, uh, do not come from, uh, you know, kind of phone calls or instant messaging or emails. They really come from a bunch of people sitting around BSing, basically, and all of a sudden an idea for a story or a certain spin on a story comes out. That same kind of idea applies in pretty much any industry. It's that spontaneous communication that you get when you're face to face that you lose mm -hmm. when you are at a distance, whether you're a distant supplier or a distant uh, a distance employee, you yeah. lose that communication, and there is something lost in the process, and that's that's the cost. So, does that cost outweigh the benefit? And that's really the question that you have to ask yourself. Yeah, the question that Steve Vaughn asked in that, in that article, good article yeah. there by Steve. And again, you can check that out. Uh, again, the the, uh, the similarities between, between offshoring and telecommuting. There, there you the go. Title, and again, it's right below the player page, right down there. Check that out. Right. Uh, good. All right. Well, um, well, you know, Dirk. Next week. That's our show for this week. Yes. But next week, we're going to have a, we're a little looking forward to something. Our, our own Ryan Day uh, has an article that, that is coming out, uh, and he's really looking at, at kind of defining quality a little bit and defining quality in terms of value and saying, well, maybe we're getting, maybe we're, we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here. And, and, and yeah, it's all about quality. We know that it's all about quality, but it's often really about value for the customer. And right. that's what he's saying in this article that is going to be... Ryan, Ryan is, is really a... What's kind of fun for us, actually, is, is most of us here, except with the exception of Ryan, have been involved in, let's say, the, quote, the quality yeah. industry, for lack, of a, for lack of a better word. Um, Ryan comes to Quality Digest for just from, from manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was from manufacturing once upon a time, a long time ago, and I've kind of forgotten some of the basic common sense yeah. that comes with just doing the job, and that's what Ryan kind of brings to some of his columns, mm -hmm. particularly this, this column, uh, was it Six Sigma Hero or Zero? Six Sigma Hero or Zero, and yeah. And basically, it's, it's, it's just common sense. I mean, yeah. it, it all boils down to you do what makes sense and you don't do what doesn't make sense. Well, cu customer, val customer, customer value. Customer value. You know, right. that, that value gets lost sometimes. You talk about quality. Quality in a vacuum means nothing. Right. Quality in a vacuum means absolutely nothing unless you're delivering, unless it's a method for delivering quality 
to your customers. Then it has value. And that's what Ryan's article is going to be talking about. So right. look forward to that next week in Quality Digest Daily, Six Sigma, Zero, or, or Here. We don't know when it's going to run yet. Probably Monday or Tuesday. I think, think it runs on Monday. So check that it out. it runs Monday. Check that out It'll be the week. top story on next Monday. Week in right. Okay. Also, uh, next Tuesday, um, well, you saw our guest earlier mm -hmm. uh, today, Dick DiRizio. Um, he is part of a webinar that's hosted by Quality Digest next Tuesday, April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, we're going to be talking about complaint management, just as we were a few minutes ago. Uh, and it, don't worry, it's not specific to FDA, even though uh, Dick's background is FDA. As we mentioned, uh, this, you know, complaint management is something that really cuts across all industries. It's something that is very important to any industry, any manufacturing or service industry. Uh, and it's something that is, should be part of your quality management system. So if you want to learn about complaint management, and the ins and outs of it, uh, be sure to sign up for that webinar. There is a link within that article by Dick DiRizio. Yep, right down uh, there. And we'll try, as I mentioned, we didn't put it below the player, but we will mm -hmm. later on. That's right. There'll be a link there. <laughs> so we're going to have a big week next week. You got yep. that great webinar, a great story from Ryan, a lot of other good content. So That's right. look out for that on Monday and, and coming after that next week. So thank you again all for joining us. Thank you for Dick, Dick DiRizio for, for joining us as well to chat a little bit about complaint handling. There you go. And Dirk, thank you for being here as always. Yeah. I really always appreciate seeing you on Friday. You too, man. Nice shirt. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. I like that. All right. Yeah. Thank you all for being with us as well, and we will uh, we'll see you next week. So long. Bye.